Good morning. This is May the 1st in the year 2000. Here in Natick, Massachusetts, this is part of the Morse Institute Library Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. And this morning we have with us James Flynn. May I call you Jim during this? You can. Okay. Jim, can we start off, uh, may I ask you your age? I'll be 81 the 26th of this month. Happy birthday in, in advance. <laughs> okay. And your marital status? Yes, married. Um, and what is your current address? Belmont, Massachusetts. Do you have children? I have four. And how about grandchildren? I have four grandchildren. Where were you born, Jim? I was born on Farm Street in Dover, Massachusetts. And raised? In Dover, Massachusetts. In Dover? Yes. And um, you, you now live in Belmont. Did I you live in Natick at any time? I did. I yeah. lived in South Natick on Union Street uh, about 1935. And I went one year to the uh, Natick High School. And let's see, what, about what year was that? 1935 to 36. You went to Natick High. Hmm. And what was Natick like when you were here? That's quite a way back. It seemed to be the, the mecca for all the towns around. We came here every, every Saturday night to shop. Even then. <laughs> yes, and I can remember the streetcars, the trolley cars running out here. Most people remember that there was far less traffic and you can make a left turn in those days. That's right. Was your, tell us about your dad and mom. Uh, what did they do back in those days? Well, my father and mother, were, they were both born in Ireland and uh, came to Dover in 1917, I believe. And they worked on a, on a farm, an estate over in Dover. My father was a chauffeur and uh, automobile mechanic and jack of all trades over there in those years. What brought them to Natick originally? Of all the United States, uh, why did they come here? Well, the people we worked for, they broke up the farm and, uh, and that type of thing, and my father had to change jobs. And they eventually moved into Boston. From Natick? From Natick, yeah. I see, okay. Now, if I read your papers correctly a few minutes ago, you entered the service way back then, didn't you? I, I entered the service, yes, I did, uh, in, in the old L Company, the 181st Infantry. Why, why did you go into the service in 1935? Well, it was something to do, and I was always fascinated with the heavy equipment and all that type of thing. You had your, you enlisted, so you had your choice of services, is that correct? Well, the, the, uh, the old company was here then, it was the closest one to Dover. I, I mean, you, you didn't think about the Navy or Marine Corps? No, or I never did. Uh, no. So you joined the Army in 1935. That's a long time before a lot of other people did a few years later. Oh, yes. And you entered the Army, uh, and you chose that branch because you were you like to work with heavy equipment, is that it? Right. What, what in your background made you an expert on that? Well, I, since I was a toddler, I was in the garage with my father yeah. doing uh, overhauls and that type of thing. We had uh, quite a bit of equipment over and over, automobiles and that thing. Well, it came, kind of came naturally to me. Can you think back uh, and tell us what the situation was in the United States for the army was very small all the armed forces were small there were, were very few men in uniform what was it like to be a part of that small group well we were kind of a group unto ourselves we uh, we met every monday night here was something to do on monday nights and we drilled and uh, had rifle practice and uh, close order drill um, we had, uh, we'd go to the range on weekends to shoot. 
up in Shrewsbury, Mass. And Does this suggest that you were in a, in a reserve unit? It was, with the Massachusetts okay. National Guard. You were in the National Guard yeah. in 1935, and what, what specific unit were you in? I was in A Company, 101st Quartermaster Regiment. And this training that you did, was that locally here in Natick? Some of, yes, I'm in the Armory, and we went to uh, Fort Devens, and we went to Camp Edwards, and we went up to New York State, too, at times. Camp Drum, something like that? Drum, and yeah. Pot Plattsburgh, and Potsdam, and, and uh, even in the Blue Hills we did winter training over there. Tell us about this training. Were you training to be an infantryman, or...? Well, uh, we all got infantry training. Yeah. Everybody got that. And then when they changed us over to the Quartermaster Regiment from the infantry, then we got the trucks in there and we started to, uh, to uh, familiarize ourselves with the different equipment. They were pretty small at that time. I'll bet they were. Yeah. About how many men were in this training group with you? We had uh, 51 men and three officers when we were federalized down here in the Natick Armory. When were you federalized? In uh, the end of uh, 1940, uh, September or October of 40. And then we moved into Camp Edwards after New Year's. After Pearl Harbor then? After Pearl Harbor. Tell us where you were on December 7th, well, 1941. Well, this was before, this was the year before Pearl Harbor. Yeah. And, and you're leading up to, were you aware of the fact or, or were people around you of tensions between us and Japan or what was going on in Europe? Uh, oh yes, we were aware of it, sure. Did you feel this would affect you pretty quickly? Oh, I, yes, sure. And in your training, uh, did they suggest to you that you guys were in on the ground floor and were oh, going to be the nucleus we, of something bigger? We, we kind of knew that. Yeah. That we were going to be gone sometime or other. So, where were you on December 7th, 1941? Uh, I, we had just, the division had just come back from North Carolina maneuvers. And uh, I got back into camp at, in Camp Edwards and they were given 24 hours off. And uh, the president spoke the next day and uh, we moved, <clears throat> we moved out to uh, the coast of Maine. We were on coast patrol for a month up in Maine. And uh, after that, we came back to Edwards and they loaded it up and we went to the port of embarkation in New York City. When you said a moment ago that you were federalized, what did that mean to you as far as your career was concerned? Not really much. We just transferred from the Massachusetts National Guard to the Army of the United States. So you're now in fully in the United States Army oh, to yes. the, uh, at the, is it, the phrase was the, at the convenience of the government <laughs> yes. until everything's, yeah. all the shooting stops all over the world. Right. What did you do off the coast of Maine for a month up there? We were on coast patrol. Uh, they were anticipating a submarine, German submarines coming in there, and uh, we had men out on the beaches, walking post. Did you do that? 30 below zero. No, I was uh, in the maintenance end of it, and we had uh, about 50 trucks up there, and the temperature was 30 below zero, and we had a time to keep those trucks running. We couldn't start them in the cold weather, you know. We had to keep some of them inside, and then we told the other ones outside to get them started. The men that were out on the beach, were they looking for submarines or people who had come ashore from submarines, or well, both? Whatever was whatever was uh, visible there, yes. They checked on everything. And that went on for a month? We were there for a month, yeah. You were withdrawn after that? We came back to Edwards. Were you with uh, family or friends or anybody that had gone into the service with you? No. You were pretty much alone, uh, except for your unit, of course. Yes, there was another fellow from Dover, Mass. He was a lot older than me. Uh, he was getting out of the service. He had done his time. 
And I had to wait for him to get out because uh, there was room for me, a new man to come in under the table of organizations. So uh, I was a, uh, like a mascot for a couple of months uh, down there. I did the drill, and, uh, but I didn't get paid. I wasn't, uh, I wasn't signed up. So when he left, they took me down to Newton and I got my shots and all this stuff. There was an opening and you took it, or they took you, is yeah. more to the point. What did you like or dislike about the training that you got? Right. It was just a normal thing to go through training. Uh, we, learned, uh, we learned the weapons and learned the, learned the drills and uh, more or less to take care of yourself under, under field conditions. Were you at the same time um, being taught how to take care of this heavy equipment that you were responsible for? Oh, yes. Mechanical yes. training and things like yes. that? Yes. Well, they sent me down to Hollabird, Maryland, down to, down to Fort Hollabird. That was a, uh, a big uh, repair base. We had equipment down there that was brought home from the Panama Canal. And uh, they rebuilt it and shipped it out again to World War II. Steam engines, steam shovels, cranes, trucks, all this type of thing. On the table of organization within your outfit, were you a uh, motor pool or? Uh, I was the motor section of my company. Yeah, yeah. okay. You knew that you were gonna be shipped someplace, uh, maybe overseas. Did the military prepare you for the cultural differences you might be facing? If you went to Europe, did they talk to you about that? or the South Pacific? Well, they never told us where we were going. I don't know what they knew themselves, but uh, we had training films and we had training manuals and uh, just, just like that, that, that's all that I can remember. Did they talk to you about the uh, people you might be facing in combat or um, in, in Europe or the Pacific? Anything about the Germans or the Japanese? Well, of course, you knew the Germans were, they were good soldiers. And what did you hear about the Japanese? They weren't very popular. Yeah, I can, I can remember being in the army base in Boston and seeing Japanese ships come in there. They wouldn't even let the crews off. What, what kind of ships were these? Uh, Maru boats. They were here. Okay, from, freighters. Freighters, yes. Yeah. And they turned them into transports. They were well equipped too. They had all, all electric winches on them, as opposed to the old, some of the old steam mm -hmm. winches and the, the other ones. Let me see if, I got, if I'm keeping up with you here. You're in Maryland. I was in Maryland, yeah. Okay, and then where did you go from there? I came back here. To the Boston area. To Boston area, and uh, we went out to Michigan by truck to Pontiac, Michigan, to pick up some new vehicles. And we had a convoy of 311 trucks coming back to Camp Edwards. What was the, the where did you take those? And, and, and please tell us exactly what time this was. Was this into 41 now? This was 41, yeah. middle, of, middle of 41. Okay. That was before we went on maneuvers down to uh, North Carolina. The, the new 6x6 six six truck, the GMC truck came out and this is what we went for. And uh, it was quite an experience bringing that convoy. It was a convoy with about 11 miles long. And uh, we came over Route 20 most of the way. I, I think I was driving behind you that day. <laughs> you could have been. <laughs> what, 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 was your, uh, re, what were your responsibilities uh, pertaining to these trucks? Did you have to keep them bright and shiny and moving all the time? We did. Well, yeah. The drivers kept them bright and shiny, but uh, we had to keep them moving. And uh, I was the last man on the convoy. We picked up the stragglers, the strays, anybody that broke down. Uh, we either got them going or poked them up on the wreck and dragged them in. 
Now you're heading in, you're into the summer and heading toward the fall of 1941. Yeah. Um, what were you doing then? We were, we were uh, well, servicing the division was part of our work, or mostly all of our work. Uh, and then we were getting ready to go to North Carolina on mm -hmm. the maneuvers. Yeah. There was the Army maneuvers that was the whole eastern part of the United States. And when you came back from those maneuvers, as you've told us, mm -hmm. Pearl Harbor. That was it. And then you go into the new year, and what happened to you in early 1942? We went to New York, port of embarkation, and we got on the Santa Elena, a transport, and we went down through the Panama Canal into Melbourne, Australia. Nonstop. We were, th we were 38 days on the water. That's a long time to be cooped up, isn't it? <laughs> sure is. Did, what, what did you do aboard ship? Did, did they, uh, you're just not out there enjoying yourselves, aren't are No, you? you stood in line to eat. And when you got out of one line, you got into another line. <laughs> so. Did you know where you were going? We didn't know until we got, to, got to, out to sea, uh, out, be out of New York Harbor. We thought we were going to go to uh, Northern uh, Europe or Iceland or some place like that because we were all equipped. Uh, we had winter clothes that we had in Maine. And uh, we got word that we were going to the South Pacific. And you went through the Panama Canal and you're headed down into yeah. the South Pacific and you're in winter clothes. Yeah. Is that correct? Right. And when did they ever figure out that you might need something better than that? Well, we, we didn't get too much. There was, see, we were the first troops overseas. We were the first um, uh, uh, ground, ground troops. Some of the Air Force units were there ahead of us, but we were the first units to go into Belmont and to Melbourne. We were only there eight days. We had to uh, battle load the ships, we had to change the cargo around. And we didn't have half the things we, uh, we started out with. What kind of reception did you get from the Australians? Great, they were out on the streets because all their people were, all their men were all over in, over in Tobruk and yeah. Africa. Did you get an opportunity to walk around and see the city? Oh, oh yes, uh, we paraded uh, from the ships to Royal Park. It was quite a trip. I guess it was. Mm. And after Melbourne, you're there eight days? Yes, yeah, so and we went up into the island of New Caledonia. That was a French possession. And the Vichy had control of it. Uh, well, we didn't really know what we were getting into there, but we got in. Would you explain who the Vichy were? They were the Vichy French. That was a French possession. And uh, when, when we got, a, got on the island, uh, we took control and, and got rid of them. Uh, sent the Governor General back to Australia as a prisoner. Why, what was your objective in, in going to New Caledonia? Uh, supply base. Yeah. See, we were set up as a task force. How large a unit were you? Um, this is a division you were talking about before. Yeah, we were a, a regimental combat team. All right, so you're, you're infantry. Infantry yeah. and some artillery and some engineers and some ordnance and some quartermaster. Now, was there any fighting involved in taking this place? No, no, no actual fighting. Tell we, us about New Caledonia. You're, you're a, a kid from Natick. And you've had a long boat ride, and then you're in a very foreign place. Well, the big thing I can remember about New Caledonia was the mosquitoes. It was terrible. Uh, this suggests uh, po the possibility of malaria? Oh, yes. Did f you or anybody in Oh, we all had know? it. I had it, too. You got it, too? Two or three times. Were you being treated with Adabrin or anything yes, like that? Yes. That was, we didn't even have Adabrin when, when we first went over there. They gave us quinine, and uh, we didn't get Adabrin until uh, I think we went into Bougainville, or on the, at the end of the canal. And how long were you at this place, at, at New Caledonia? 
Uh, we were there about eight months. Can you tell us what it was like? What did it look like? Well, a little. It was a little town, uh, Numia. It was a port, and New Caledonia was uh, famous for uh, nickel ore. They had nickel docks there, and uh, it was uh, hilly. And it stretched out about uh, 250 miles. But you think a lane road, gravel road running the whole length of the island. Was, was this uh, what you might characterize as a jungle? Uh, no, covered? it no. was more like farming. Uh, uh, there were some ranches there. Name Frank a place in the United States that would look like it. Pardon? Name a place in the United States that would look like New Caledonia. Oh. Probably right uh, the Berkshire area, maybe, of uh, Massachusetts. Many trees? Yes, there were trees, yes. And uh, it was uh, mountains in the, in, the, in the center and uh, plains on the coastal areas. Uh, and that's where everybody lived. Where'd the mosquitoes come from? Oh, <laughs> every place. It was terrible, the mosquitoes. And you were there eight months, so this brings yeah. us up into what part of 1942 now? Yeah. We went to the canal then. As you went from New Caledonia to Guadalcanal? To Guadalcanal, yeah. So you're, land, you're in 1942, the August? No, the Marines went in in August. We didn't get in there until September and October and November, different parts of the division. Tell us about sailing to Guadalcanal. You were aware of the fact that there was a very fierce battle going on there. Oh, yes. What did you hear yeah. about it? Well, we knew that some of the Navy ships came, uh, come, were coming back out of the battles of the Coral Sea, the first battle and the second battle, the Bismarck Sea. And uh, I was aboard the carrier Hornet the, a couple of days before she went down. Where did you go aboard the Hornet? Uh, <clears throat> it came back to Numea. And uh, the, the uh, cruise of Chicago was there, where the bow gone. That's from the battles off of Sabo? Mm. And did you talk to people who had been involved in those big naval engagements? Oh, yes. We had uh, some of the casuals. And the casualties, they came down the beach. And uh, we had two fellows living with us that were casual. They were on a, on a ship that was sunk, but they were, you know, they were saved enough. And what, and your, your job at that time was still motor pool and yes, the large equipment you were working motor pool all the way, with. yeah, heavy equipment. How did you come to be on the Hornet? Oh, she just came into Numia and uh, like was on a, on a Sunday or something, and uh, there was boats going out, so we went out to visit the Hornet to see what it was like. And you say in a few days later it was sunk? She was sunk, yeah. That was the first Hornet. Can you tell us anything you remember about being on the Hornet? Uh, they obviously were making ready for sea. Um, what was the, the tone of the ship at that time? Their expectations? No, there was no... Uh, they seemed to be uh, up, upgrade about everything. I yeah. the fellows I spoke to. We went on there looking for some ice cream. <laughs> did you get it? Yes, we did. <laughs> In your duties uh, on New Caledonia, you sound as though now that you're seeing a lot of people either going out to the, the front, which was at that time Guadalcanal, mm -hmm. um, or coming back from it. What, what impressions did you get about the war and the way it was going and, and the, uh, the success or failure of the U.S. Armed Forces? No, it wasn't, the news wasn't too good at the, <clears throat> at the first part of it. But, uh, I mean, we just expected we'd be going up there. Yeah. So there, there came a time now you got orders to go over to Guadalcanal. Oh, yes. How did you get there? 
by ship. Okay. And yeah, how, long, how long a ride is that, a sail? It was about five days uh, altogether. And where we, did you land? We zigzagged. We landed right on, um, on uh, the Red Beach, right, right on the canal between Savo Island and, uh, and, and the canal itself. And at, at that time, had the Marines uh, secured the island? Or no. No? So there, there wasn't much beyond Henderson Field that was in American no. hands, is that correct? This, the 164th Infantry from the Americal <coughs> was the first unit to, uh, to go assist the Marines up there. And then the 182nd Infantry, I went up with them. They were, we were on the second echelon that went up there. And then the other was units... Was your, your commanding general, Alexander Patch, is that He correct? was our for, first yeah. commander, yeah. Okay. So, t putting Guadalcanal in perspective, and I, I think it's, it's seldom done, it, it was eight months to the day after Pearl Harbor that the Marines went ashore there. So it was really one of the first major battles Oh, it was. Against the Japanese, and everybody, this yep. was a learning experience for everybody involved. Oh, sure it was. What about your outfit? Did you know what was expected of you or what to do? No, we went up there to, to well, to assist, to handle supplies. We had to get, get equipment ashore, trucks or tractors, and, and uh, the engineers went in and made some roads. Uh, we even uh, carried water on our backs up to the infantrymen up, up on the lines. It, now, is this Army or the Marine Corps? This, the Marine Corps, too. We were attached to the Marines at that time. First Marine Division? First, second, and third Marines. I wear a, a Marine patch on my, show, on my uniform. Do you really? Early on in the career, the, the, the battle for Guadalcanal, the American Navy had to withdraw because they were afraid for their carriers. Uh, the ships went out back out to sea, sure. Yeah, that's correct. Were, yeah. were you there during the starving time when, when people really didn't have enough food? Uh, I think we brought food in with us. Uh, I think that was about the end of the starving time. So your ship's work could come and go down the so-called slot? Well, yes, this was later, but they, uh, they went to sea every night. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they didn't stay anchored. Uh, because of the bombing? Well, that, and then the Japanese force was coming in there every night. We were shelled every night and bombed every night, every where, day and night. Where did you stay while you were there? A pup tent. In tents? Or in a hole. A and ships hole. were bombarding you at night? Oh, yeah. Those, we were 10-inch high explosives sure, coming in. That's the two... Two Japanese battleships were coming down yeah. and they're shooting at yeah, you. Yeah, you could hear the shells going over. Can you tell us about that? I mean, try to, for people who weren't there, yeah. what was it like? The word helpless comes up a lot. Yeah. <laughs> you're in your tent and it's getting dark and you're on Guadalcanal. Were the, yeah. Was there shooting around you? Oh, there was all kinds of activity going on. But you didn't get out of your hole at night because you'd be shot. You got into your hole and stayed there. Were you um, armed? Oh, sure. With what? I had a, an old three that I brought from Natick. A Springfield rifle? Yeah. Made up in Springfield, Massachusetts? Right, yeah, the old, the old, old three. Were you then in combat? Well, not we weren't on the lines, but we were, still, every place was combat. There was no rear area because the area was so small. Their artillery could reach any place, and they had air superiority for a while, and naval superiority. Was there any time when you fired at the enemy? Oh, sure, sure. Is this infantry attacks against your position? Sure. Yeah, sure. Can you and tell us? And we had snipers. They, they snipers? Were, and, and they'd yeah. be around all the time. They were, they were great jungle people. During the day, how could you do your work under those conditions? You just did. Were you being fired at during the day? Sometimes, sometimes, and uh, the, the air raids that come, uh, you'd get air raids every probably every hour, every two hours. And of course, uh, the mosquitoes were raiding us too. Did you, were you in sight of or nearby Henderson Field? 
Oh yes, I was on Henderson Field. We were on the perimeter. So you could see the planes coming and going? Yes. Yeah, some of them. This is the so-called Cactus Air Force? Cactus Air Force, yeah. There was two strips there, Fighter 1 and Fighter 2. We were right in the end of, one, of Fighter 1. And they blew up a plane. They came in and blew up a plane uh, from here to that church, from my bunk, from my tent. A couple of hundred yards away from you? Sure, just a naval SBD. They put a, put a uh, grenade or something in it and blew it up. You say they blew it up. Somebody came in and yeah, actually the, the put a charge on the plane? Yeah. So there were sappers coming into your area? In, yeah, infiltrators, sure. Did you any... Do you, you said a moment ago you had actually fired your rifle, so oh, yeah. obviously you saw a Japanese. Oh, yes. Tell us about seeing the Japanese. Was this at night, daytime? No, daytime. We were going up to the lines bringing up water. And they, like I say, there were snipers there in the, uh, in the trees. That's what they get up in trees, tied themselves in. At and this you, time, how, what were you carrying the water in or on? Five gallon can on your back. On your back. Yeah. They were short of water, short of rations, short of ammunition. We unloaded uh, uh, 155 howitzer ammunition uh, by hand from uh, the, the Higgins boats, one at a time, 96 pounds apiece on your shoulder, and you walked up the beach with it. When we got it up there, we, we'd never made it. It's hard to visualize what you're saying here, uh, carrying the water to men on the line who are really fighting very close to the enemy. When you got close to that situation, um, you were then under fire. Oh, sure. We got caught up there one, one time. We stayed, had to stay all night. We couldn't get back. Well, you dug your hole and got into it and stayed there. Were you called upon to uh, become an infantryman and rather than uh, Somebody hauling stuff up? Did you fire back? Oh, yes, yeah, sure. Well, we were issued the Grand, the grand Rifle uh, eventually, and uh, we were issued the little carbine after that. Uh, and we, there was an offensive weapon, both of them were. And all this time, uh, every night you're being bombed and shelled, and then in the daytime, the Americans would take over and do their thing. Yeah. The Navy would come back in, the yeah. supply operation would start again, daylight. And uh, Is this still September of 42? Or you were into October? Are you well, October, along? we were there until, um, until January of 43, I think. I do was sort of six or eight months on, 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 on Guadalcanal. Did you feel a sense sometime that the, the rhythm was changing, that the Americans eventually were grinding out the, the island and going to capture it? Oh, no, sure. We knew we were going we we to make it. How did you know that? Well, it's a feeling. Did you see them expanding further prisoners. away into the island, away p past the airport? and? Uh, oh, yes. Up toward the North Shore where the Japanese were coming in. Yes, I went down to, up as far as Cape Esperance, way up. We had our trucks were mm -hmm. moving equipment up there. Did you have occasion to go over to any other island like Tulagi? I went to Tulagi once. It was 21 miles across the Straits. I went over on a, on a Higgins boat. We had some equipment over there that was supposed to be on the canal that landed on the other side, so I went over to get it and bring it back. It sounds as though you, you covered quite a bit of a very historic place. May I ask you if you've ever been... ...have, but I haven't. I don't like time to, uh, to think of going back. I saw enough of it, I guess. It's so changed that this around you uh, as you were doing your you mentioned the first marine division yes, we supported them and uh, and and they supported us and uh, 
We had the 37th Division, that was another National Guard Division from Ohio. And the 43rd Division was there in part. They were from Connecticut, New England too. In fact, I had a cousin in that. Were, you didn't see those people that often. Oh yes, they had dog fights up there. With the zeros. They were fighting the, against the zeros oh, and the oh, bombers. Sure, that were the first in. part of it. You yeah. saw that. In the and they knocked them out. How about Washington Machine Charlie? Did he finally leave you alone? <laughs> yeah, I think so. I guess I, I'm going to ask you um, how your health was at that time, because you had picked up several pretty lousy things in Guadalcanal. Yeah, on the whole it was very good. I was never sick, really. And how about the men you were with or responsible for? Did well, you lose men uh, because of diseases? Were they sent home? Well, uh, I had nobody sent home. One man got hurt uh, and, and sent and sent home, but uh, the others, uh, it was uh, like into the, the station hospital or something, and they'd be in for a couple of days and out again. How about your own health? You said you started at quinine and worked up to atabrine. Were, mm -hmm. were the treatments getting better for what uh, they were discovering you were subject to? Well, we had to take it by Rasta. When you went up on the mess line, this first side was there, you took your pill. And they tasted awful. Did you all oh. turn yellow? Yes, I was all yellow. You, you had the Pacific yellows. Yeah. yeah. 
What was your greatest uh, challenge when you were in combat and under all these uh, hmm. terrible living conditions? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> challenge. Stay alive, I guess. Were you wounded at any no, time? No, I was lucky. Were any of your men uh, struck well, we had, by any of yes, this? Yes, we had some uh, some people hurt, yeah. Can you describe the medical treatment you got? Did you think it was uh, the best that you could have gotten? Oh, yes. Yes. We had a man assigned to uh, from our medical detachment. Were there, was there anything like a, a, a mass unit uh, or what kind of uh, area did you go to receive medical treatment? We had, a, we had a, an aid man right in the company. And uh, up so at the division. equivalent of a corps man. A corps man, same yeah. thing. Yeah. And then up at division, they had a, uh, they had a medical detachment. Uh, and then we had the hospitals and the medical regiments. The war was going on much more rapidly now all around you. They were moving further north and, and mm. further west. How did you keep track of what was happening? Well, we had the Armed Forces Radio, the Mosquito ne Network, they called it. And that kept us uh, informed. Did you get anything? Did you get stars and stripes out there to read? Uh, Stars and tribes. I don't. I don't think so. I don't know now. I don't remember. How about Tokyo Rose? Oh yes, we listen to her all the time. Tell us about that. There's some people <laughs> uh, are not quite that familiar with her. Yeah. Yes, she was on all the time, and she knew she knew as much as we did about the place. She called us by name sometimes. The units over the air, and she played all the American music, you know. And told you what was happening to your girlfriends back home. Right, all yeah. that business, yeah. yeah. We were starving on the canal and I was eating a chicken leg. <laughs> That's one she missed. Any time where you folks offered R&R um, &R in some rear area so that you could get off the line or uh, get some peace and quiet a while? Uh, we weren't ourselves, but, uh, but the infantry units, they backed them off. Uh, at different times. Did you ever get to see a USO show or uh, oh, yes. Bob Hope come through? Jack Benny, Bob Hope, Martha Tilton, Jerry Colonna, uh, Joe, 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 I can't remember his first name. Did you get to um, form any opinion about the people you were facing and, and who were shooting at you, uh, the Japanese? You said very early on that uh, they weren't too popular in your world, but you saw a lot of them and some pretty close up. What did you think about the, the people you faced? Get him before he gets you. Did you feel that they were, uh, I'm going to use the word good, but professional soldiers and oh, yes, they were. very adequate? Uh, we were up against the Japanese uh, Imperial Marines. They were all six footers. It was, they were supposed to be the group that went in, into Nanking in China. Yes. Years before. The rape of Nanking. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Well, you have to understand the army is run on rumors, whether they're good or bad. You know, you, <laughs> you hear things. In in the uh, navy or in the marine corps, that was scuttlebutt, and yeah. uh, it was a marvelous grapevine that stretched way across the Pacific. Sure. Did you find sometimes you get news from that before you did from your officers? Oh, I suppose sure. Yes. And how did you feel when Tokyo Rose called you by name? <laughs> well, not my name. No, Just the young. outfit. <laughs> yeah. Did that give you the, make you feel a little uneasy that no. she had... G no. You just appreciated her music. Sure. Good entertainment. Did you feel that you were properly equipped when you were sent in to do your job? 
Yes, we were equipped with the best we had. Was the best they had as good as what the Japanese had? Oh, the, the, the Garand rifle was, uh, yeah. How about, uh, you, you mentioned long-range rifles and things like that before, artillery. Did oh yes, we had plenty of artillery. Did you yes. feel uh, what the equipment the Americans had was inferior or better oh, than? Oh no, we had the best. In all respects, in tanks, trucks, yeah. everything else? Oh yeah. What about the allies, the people that you ran into from other countries? What was your opinion of them, the British, New Zealanders? The Australians, uh, they were great men, uh, great men in the, in the jungles, were great fighters. I had a, a small unit of them attached to my unit for maintenance on their trucks or equipment. Mm -hmm. But they had those uh, British uh, Chevrolet desert trucks, you know. But the engines were, uh, were the same, so we could swap parts back and forth. I haven't asked you about your contact with home, uh, Natick or the United States. Mm. Um, was it close and did you feel you had a good grip on what was happening in the United States at this time? Oh yes, because my, my wife, my girlfriend then to, to write to me and my people. And uh, my school teacher over in Dover wrote to me all the time. Did you have any idea what was going on in Europe at this time? Only what was coming over the air. Did that seem a long way away in yes. uh, some other world and yeah. I'll worry about that at some other time? I knew very little about the European war actually. We'd get it in the newsreels. Uh, they had movies that were some time or another. Yeah. Since the war, have you gone back to uh, fill in that gap have you read history books to uh, learn about the Russian campaigns or D-Day in Europe? Oh, I'm on the television with that crusade in the Pacific and uh, those programs on, uh, tw on 25 there. Are you learning anything that you didn't know way oh, back yes. then? Oh yes, and, 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 and the pictures, uh, the, their equipment, and amazing the way their tanks uh, across Europe. Mm -hmm. We, we got you up to Bougainville now. Um, mm -hmm. Where did you go from there? I went to Hollandia, New Guinea. And how long were you there? Uh, we were there uh, five days. Uh, we formed the convoy, uh, the battle convoy for Leyte. You were going up to the Philippines? Up to Leyte, up to the Philippines. After five days, they put you back at sea? Yeah, we didn't even Leyte. get off the ship. They kept us right on the ship. And how, how long a sail was it up to Leyte? Oh, about four or five days. And were you part of the invasion there? No, well, the invasion, we were, we were uh, invasion plus, uh, I don't know, eight or ten days or something like that. The 77th Division went in ahead of us. And, and Leyte, what did that look like vis-a-vis uh, -vis where you had been before? It was tropical, but uh, Inland, there, there was a lot of open space there too. We landed outside of the town, city of town of uh, Takloban. And that was more or less industrial. I know there was a, a, a gasoline cracking plant there and uh, other buildings pretty well blown up by that time. Much more civilized though than where you'd been before. Yeah. More infrastructure. And then we went through when you say we, now you're in the, the, the Americal. The, the Americal. We went through the 77th Division and uh, leapfrogged them. And we went into the mountains and across Leyte. We picked up there and across Leyte. And then on to Cebu. That was the other, the next dial. And I, that's where I terminated. I came home from there. Before we examine the word terminated, um, in the Philippines, were, was your ultimate boss now Douglas MacArthur? Yes, we came back under the army. We we returned to 14th Corps, and we and General MacArthur became our division commander, army commander. Yep. 
And you were in a country now that uh, you felt the, the next stop is Tokyo. You were... Yes. Okay. Yes. And what, what, what was your rank at this point? Same rank. I mean, you were a master sergeant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you'd been in the service now since 1935. Mm -hmm. And it's coming close to 1945. Yeah. Uh, so you're a 10-year veteran. Yes, just and about. How many people around you were with you from the start? Uh, there was one fellow from A Company. He and I came all the way. He later came from Wellesley. Uh, and he got home ahead of me, uh, a little bit ahead of me. but. How is it that you were terminated uh, in the Philippines? You say you're, you're going home now. Yes, they wanted to get rid of all the old timers. Was it yeah. your age that? Uh, oh no, I was only 26 years old then. And you were an old timer. An old timer then. And you sailed home. I came home on uh, yes, I came into San Francisco. We were 32 days coming home. <laughs> That's better than when you went over. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and can you tell the, exa the exact date you got home? I can tell by, uh, we asked the conductor on the train what the flags were at half mass for, and we, uh, we didn't know that President Roosevelt died. That was the so you were in April of 45? Yeah. Yeah. And you were still? You're still in the armed forces, though, is that correct? Oh, yes. And did you think you were going to be there till the, the end of the war? Oh, yes. All right. Yeah. You're coming home across country in, in April of 45. Where yeah. did you go? Boston? Came to Fort Evans. Yeah. And then we got a delay en route, a time off, home for 30 days, I think. And then I got assigned, reassigned to Fort Lewis, Washington, the base engineering depot out there. They sent you all the back, back across country. Yeah. Stop a minute. You, did you get to see this lady friend that uh, is your wife now? Yes. And did, do you meet people that uh, told you about what Natick was doing during the war? And oh yes, we came out to Natick here. Yeah. Anything new and different? Well, it's a lot different now. Today. No, I meant then. Um, what, what were your impressions of being home? Oh, it was just something, a relief. Well, it was, we got married. During your, that yeah, time? Yeah, yes, the 29th day Good of April. Good for you. Yeah, that's 15, 55 years ago. And then they put you on a bus and <laughs> a train and sent you out to Washington. No, I never made it. I, uh, we went up to uh, Lake Placid, New York for rehabilitation and reassignment. And during that time, we were uh, processed, and they were letting all the uh, all the infantry people out, and the artillery, and the medics, and so forth. And they wanted me to go back to uh, to uh, Fort Lewis, but I went down to see a couple of colonels, and they reviewed my record with my malaria and everything else involved in it. They issued special orders for me to go to Fort Evans for discharge. Was the point system in effect then? Yes. You must have had a million points. Yeah. <laughs> we needed 110. I think I had 128, 129. So, so but I wasn't alone either. They owed you th well, more than just a discharge. Yeah. You're discharged in the early spring of 1945. I was discharged on my birthday, the 26th of May. Okay. And the war in Europe had just ended. Right. Uh, the war in Japan went on until August. But yeah. you were through and home. I dropped the bomb and that saved everybody. Did you join the reserves or anything after you No, got, I uh, went to work for the MBTA in Boston and uh, the hours I worked I couldn't join anything. How about but any I have a veterans vet organization? I'm, in, like I'm in, in three veterans organizations. The Guadalcanal Campaign Veterans and the uh, Disabled American Veterans and the American Division, right here. 
Would you mind holding that book up and uh, showing that to us? Um, this is our shoulder patch. And that's for the AmeriCal division the, in which you served? That's the Southern Cross on the Blue Pacific. Yeah. And you were in that outfit for most of your career while you were overseas yes. at least. And I'm still a member of the, of the Veterans Organization. Okay, thank you for showing that. Can you tell me about, if you can sum up, what were your feelings about being home and what you had done? Well, I didn't do any more than anybody else. Well, it's a whole, whole new way of life. First of all, I was a married man. That changes things, as you know. How about uh, your family and community? You came home to a totally new world. Oh, yes. How were you received uh, when you came home? Oh, great. <laughs> the big hero. <laughs> now, I had two brothers in the service, too. What, what uh, services were they in? My, uh, my uh, fellow after me, he was in the, in the Air Force, he was training to be a pilot, and uh, when the bulge came on in Europe, they shipped them all over there, and he ended up in the infantry. And my younger brother, they relieved the, uh, he was in Japan, and they relieved the AmeriCal Division when the AmeriCal was being stood down. His outfit took over the 1st Cavalry, and they went up into, into Korea. And did they come home safely? The two of them came home safely, yeah. But they're both gone now. How important to you was serving in the military? Oh, uh, I think it put a whole focus on your life. I wouldn't have missed it. How did it affect the rest of your life? Well, I mean, I've had a lot of friends in the military and still do, the fellows are living. What did you think then, um, and what do you think now about the war that you served in? Well, it was something that had to be done at the time. Maybe the, uh, the other crowd would have run and overrun the world if we didn't. Do you feel in, in looking back over what you did and, and remembering what it was like when you came home, um, there was a difference or was a difference in public opinion regarding the men who served perhaps in Korea or Vietnam? Oh, I think there was a difference, sure. Can you tell us I about I think there that? were more of us anyway. Beg pardon? There were more of us World War II. There were 13 million men under arms. There were more. Besides but I, sheer we numbers. We didn't have any yeah. big parades or anything when we came home. Did you receive any uh, veterans' benefits because of your the diseases that uh, you I had a 10 percent, uh, a 20 percent, I guess, and then they cut it back to 10 percent, which, which I'm still, uh, I still get. Is this the, the malaria or? Yeah, malaria and operational fatigue or whatever else they called it. Do you receive any uh, benefits from the VA, such as uh, the GI Bill or hospitalization or insurance or? I, I, we had the GI Bill I bought my house with. Okay. Is there any one thought or memory that uh, in, in, in this tape that your family will look at and historians will for a long time to come that some overriding thing that I haven't asked you today that you'd like to talk about? There's nothing I can think of. Well, then we thank you for coming in today. Well, it's our pleasure to have had you here. Uh -huh. Thank you.